Finding Our Humanity, my last book, is, is connecting a more personal and spiritual journey for people about the environment and, and compassion and, and love for, the, for our planet and other human beings as well as animals in a, in a holistic approach to understand what motivates us as the orangutan project to, to dedicate our lives to this cause. Hi everyone, welcome to Now Boarding, a new travel podcast by me, Payal Nair. This show aims at creating awareness about ecotourism, sustainable tourism, responsible travel, and a lot more. We will cover stories and journeys of people who are ecotourism specialists and those who are leaders in their field. We will also be talking to people who have had unique travel experiences, remarkable conceptual places to stay, unexplored cultures and ancient histories of various towns and cities around the world. Join me in this journey of knowing more about travel. Get inspired to see the world and discover your inner self. Hi everyone, today I am in conversation with Leif Cox, who is the founder of the Orangutan Project. He's a zoologist, an author, a speaker, a world-renowned advocate and campaigner on behalf of the orangutans, and that's not it. He's also the <clears throat> excuse me, president of the International Elephant Project, International Tiger Project, and Wildlife Asia and Forests for People. And all of these are dedicated to the survival of the critically endangered species and their habitats. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Thank you. It's great to be here. So let's start by asking you what inspired you to work specifically with the orangutans? Mm -hmm. I was w working with 15 orangutans and discovered that they're self-aware persons just as we are and they didn't belong in captivity. And I quickly also found out, unfortunately, that we were driving to the extinction in the most horrific ways that we can imagine, being burnt alive, murdered, machete to death. And so that set me on my lifelong journey to save orangutans in the wild, in their rainforest home. And that orangutan conservation will be the umbrella of work that would hopefully then take along all the other megaforms, such as elephants and tigers, and humanity through this extinction crisis. And which part of Indonesia are, do you really find them? In, in ancient times, orangutans existed all the way up into southern China, all the way down to the island of Java, Indonesia. In modern times, they've only existed in two islands, Sumatra, which is totally Indonesian, and the island of Borneo, which the majority in the south is, is the Indonesian provinces of Kalimantan. But there is in the north a small amount of land mass, which is um, owned by Malaysia in two states, Sarawak and Sabah. Okay, so that's where you really, so that's where most of your work gets done in, in that part of the world. So what... Is exactly, on the islands of Sumatra and Borneo. Uh, Borneo and Sumatra. Okay. What really is causing, so I'm, I'm assuming that the population of the orangutans is rapidly reducing. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. It, the critically endangered in the populations are plummeting. As one example, because there's three species of orangutans, and we probably need to talk about each one separately, but just give an example. Over the last 20 years, we've lost 100,000 born in orangutans that have been murdered. And now 80% of the rainforest where all the species of orangutans lives have gone. And now most orangutans, including the tigers and elephants, um, are living in degraded habitat outside of protected areas. And so we have a very small window of opportunity to save this critically endangered, beautiful species that share our planet. Okay. So can you just describe some of the, you know, obviously they get rehabilitated and and your effort is to then release them into the wild. So can you talk a little bit about some of 
uh, what is the kind of work that's getting done in mm -hmm. order for that to happen. Yeah, just just to emphasize the main game in conservation, and it's no different for orangutans, is habitat protection. So we have to protect the habitat for the species to survive. And we're working in at seven different habitats across the two islands to secure enough habitat, the right type, shape and size of rainforest for the rainforest to survive in itself, but to allow sustainable populations of rain tanks to survive in the future. However, unfortunately, the vast majority of orangutan's former habitat has been destroyed and converted to unsustainable monocultures such as palm oil and pulp paper. And so orangutans are then killed as agricultural pest or, and the babies are taken away into the illegal pet trade. And so we had some wonderful partners and staff who go out and rescue the orangutans, put them in quarantine, make them healthy, rehabilitate the orangutans psychologically, behaviorally and physically, and release them into areas where there's no longer viable populations of orangutans, but our conservation teams and partners have managed to secure viable forests for them to live free again in their own societies and culture. So you're saying that you do have community support as well from around the rainforest. They do help mm -hmm. in, in the rehabilitation. They do help in you know, trying to get them back into the wild. And it, do you need to educate them? Because I, I'm assuming that these communities have obviously lived their way before you or anyone else who's into conservation of the orangutans. So they're probably more familiar with them. And at the same time, they're probably, as you mentioned, for you know, trading and things like that, the babies are being being taken away. So is there any kind of education that they need to be mm -hmm. provided with in order for them to have a better understanding on how they can co-inhibit, you know, the rainforests and they don't have to really do anything to them to, to, to yeah. destroy them or, yeah. No, there's a couple of important points here. Is one is the, the misunderstanding that poor indigenous people are destroying the environment. They're not. It's rich multinationals which are destroying the environment. The indigenous communities are victims as well as the orangutans, tigers and elephants and other biodiversity. Their ancestral land is not recognised and their forms of survival for for centuries, for example, slash and burn agriculture or hunter and gathering is totally sustainable. However, it's no longer sustainable because a vast majority of their lands have been taken away by greedy multinationals who have destroyed the rainforest homes of these indigenous communities. So this is why we started Forest for People. We work with those indigenous communities to modify new forms of agriculture, such as shade coffee, shade cocoa, shade vanilla for cash crops, developing regenerative agricultural systems. So they can once again become a sustainable part of their ancestral homes, at least what's left of it. And now the, the other aspect to obviously that is that the people who are doing the actual rescue, rehabilitation and release, now they're actually, you know, well-educated, trained professionals, you know, that, that's, a, you know, and so, so I guess in that context, we have, you know, we have local people, yes, but they're, but they're trained, educated professionals in, for, say, the conservation of these species. And, and then we work with the Indigenous communities for win-win solutions for people, environment, and animals. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the books that you have authored. I understand there are three books that you've already published and there's one more or are there two books that you've published and there's a third one mm -hmm. which recently got yeah. published? Yeah, I've published three books so far 
and the first one, Arrange Tanks and a Battle for Survival, is about my early story working hands on with orangutans, you know, and learning how wonderful and these unrecognized persons who share our planet, how beautiful and unique they are and, 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 and should be valued. And then orangutans, my cousins, my friend, my second book explores the further journey of orangutans, starting the orangutan project and actually then bringing orangutans from captivity and releasing them back into the wild. Finally, Our Humanity, my last book, is, is connecting a more personal and spiritual journey for people about the environment and, and compassion and, and love for, the, for our planet and other human beings as well as animals in a, in a holistic approach to understand what motivates us as the orangutan project to, to dedicate our lives to this cause. Okay. Can you, so what, when you first went into the forest, into the rainforest, how, just a little bit about the behavior of the orangutans, how do you, what kind of an understanding and communication develops over time? What are some of the steps that you take for it? You know, just, just a little mm -hmm. bit about you being in that environment, not just, I mean, specifically I'm talking about you because you're the one who's most closely associated with the project. I mean, it's your project. So just a little bit about the behavior and, and how long does it take for an orangutan to, because if they're in captivity, they're already anxious and there's fear. So how do you help develop and overcome that anxiety mm -hmm. and fear and become close to being able to communicate with these orangutans? Mm. Yeah, I mean, as far as the rehabilitation, I say there's actually four building blocks that we have to do and you have to build on top of them. And the first building block is physical health. So the orangutans will have lost fingers and have machete wounds from when the mother was killed. They may have human diseases, be malnourished, etc. And so they need immediate veterinary care to get them to a level of physical health. Next aspect to it is because of self-aware persons, just as we are, going through all this trauma and deprived of a natural upbringing, they, their, their mental health needs to be supported. This is love, affection, security. These sorts of things provide the orangutans the opportunity to mentally recover. And so physical health gives the opportunity for mental health recovery. Mental health recovery allows for the next stage, which is social recovery, getting them to learn how to interact with other orangutans, connecting with other orangutans, cooperating with other orangutans. So this is social health. And the, once we have those three building blocks, we can go to the last building block, which is forest skills, learning how to make a nest at night to in the trees. Because, for example, some other tigers, the tigers on the ground that will eat you. You have to live and nest in the trees. How to find food, how to spot the dangers, and building up a toolbox of skills and knowledge, which will give them the basic ability to start their journey to independence and once again living free in a while in their own societies and in their own culture. Now, as far as communicating with orangutans, it's been obviously, I just give you one example of an interesting journey. It's because we often, as humans, we, we, we tend to think everything communicates as, as we do. And, that, and one of the classic examples I learned this is many years ago, I, I had a, a diabetic orangutan, a big male, huge big male, canines, seven times stronger than a man. And the vet said, look, we've got six weeks to give him diabetes, take his blood, monitor his, his glucose levels and give him the injections, otherwise he's going to die. So I started training him, you know, with positive reinforcement to give him, you know, so I can take blood and give him the injections. And I realized halfway through, he wasn't listening to what I said. He was picking up on my body language. And, 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 and so orangutans, although they do have a vocal repertoire, 
um, to ex express their feelings and intent over some distance. The vast majority of the communication is through body language. And that, that can't be too surprising, although we're often not consciously aware of it. Psychologists tell us, you know, there's a huge amount of human communication is also done through body language. Yeah. yeah. So how long does this process take? Because you're looking at the physical, the, the mental, the social, all of these aspects to actually get the orangutan ready to be out of captivity and into the wild, how long mm -hmm. would it typically take for all of this to happen and mm -hmm. for them to be ready to go into the wild? Yeah. The, the first thing to acknowledge is each orangutan is an individual. And so individual personality, individual attributes. So one size is never going to fit all. But also they have individual stories, how long they've been with the mother, their, how long in captivity, what's those experiences in captivity. And, and also the, the, the sex, if they're male or female, their, their needs and, and their a reaction to the rehabilitation release program can actually be quite different. Mm -hmm. So it is extremely variable, you know. So, but on average, the you know, if we have to take a, a bell curve and the medium time it takes to bring an orangutan from rescue to release, I would say is five years. How do you, when you you personally, you sort of have gone through, you know, work along with your team to actually get an orangutan it probably becomes like a friend for you right or to you how do you mm -hmm. personally and emotionally feel when you've actually been successful and mm -hmm. that particular orangutan is now in the wild emotionally it you know you probably because you've had this whole connection and close proximity and you've worked mm. on getting the orangutan ready to go into his or her natural habitat. So how do you feel personally at the end of the journey? Mm. Yeah, look, I've had a privilege of working with this more noble form of humanity, far more noble and you know, in many aspects to humans. And, you know, and... And so that's been the greatest privilege of my life. And also being an orangutan mother for some time, looking after sick babies, being at orangutans when they're born, and then taking them on that entire journey to see them free again in, in the wild. And it's, it, it's extremely wonderful and rewarding. And of course, all altruism and, and helping other living beings on the planet is ultimately beautiful and rewarding. Now, orangutans in captivity are, are really an ugly caricature of the magnificence, you know, and the potential of these beautiful persons. So going to a zoo or, or, or you know, or even a sanctuary if they're kept in cages, it's like going to a human prison and then studying them there and determining this is how humans are. Yeah. Of course, that is not the true potential of our dignity that, and beauty which you, humans can express. Now, orangutans, once they're back into the natural environment where they evolved, you know, over millions of years, there's a beauty and majesty, you know, and they adapt to the environment primarily through culture, as we do. And, and so you see that beauty as well as, they, as you know, as they try to re-engage and understand their culture, learning off other orangutans, to again to live in in dignity and freedom once more. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. So, how do you think individuals and the general public can contribute to the effort of conservation of the orangutans? And I'm not just saying financially, but also through advocacy. What are some of the ways that they can, those listening to the interview can actually mm -hmm. contribute. Yeah, I, I mean, there's really only two ways to affect meaningful change completely in the world. 
in individual action is not an effective way of making change and it never will be. And human beings have never achieved Dean strength through individual action. It's only through collectivization that we achieve things. So there's two ways to collectivize. It's collectivize our capital. So in other words, you become a donor to an organization that is making a meaningful change that you want to see in the world. The next opportunity is to collectivize our labor. And so people can volunteer to, you know, they run quiz nights and do stalls and, and do engagement as a team. Mm. Yeah. And, and, you know, and then that way they collectivize the labor to, in, to then obviously, obviously gain capital, which can be used for direct meaningful conservation for orangutans on, on the ground. The, 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 then obviously that can actually, those two things can actually come together on the echo tours that we, we do into the wild so people can see it, the majesty and beauty of orangutans, get nightly lectures, see the heroes, the real heroes on the ground who are working there every day, helping rescue, rehabilitate and release orangutans. And that collectivization of their time and their money yeah, benefits themselves, as all altruism does but also then allows the, the outcomes of those ecotures to make meaningful change. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's very, very useful for those who are listening in. If they do want to, if they want more awareness, then they can pick up your books. And if they do want to actually make a difference, then these are some of the ways that they, they should be able to do it. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the kind of effort that the Orangutan Project and all your other projects are, the kind of involvement that there is, I'm sure it, it must be very, very rewarding for you. And um, you're making, truly making a difference. So thank you so much for this conversation, Liv. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Now Boarding, a travel podcast. Check out other episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. And of course, don't forget to share your thoughts with us. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes only on Now Boarding, a travel podcast.